I, you've seen that I have intervened very um, infrequently. I'm trying not to do a little talk before a talk before a talk, right? But in this case, I'm making an exception because Don De Plowman, the Executive Vice Chancellor of the University, has uh, graciously agreed to introduce Thomas Edlechek. Uh And when I first thought about inviting Thomas, I immediately asked Don De, almost a year ago now, and I came back from Prague with a copy of your book. And I took it to her office because I wanted, Don Day's an economist and used to be the former dean of the business school. So I thought there'd be nobody, nobody better uh, to introduce one of my favorite people. Uh, so I have two of my favorite people now taking the stage. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I guess I need to make a very little brief uh, correction to that. I was the dean of the business school. I'm not an economist. So I'm here to learn today. My background is strategy and organizational behavior. But behavioral economics is a big thing in business schools now. And so I couldn't be more thrilled to introduce our guest today. Let me just say a couple of things, and then we, we want to hear from you. We're really fortunate because it's rare, I think, that at academic con conferences you get someone who's not only an economist, an author, but a media personality. So that, that ensures us we're going to be thrilled here for the next hour and a half or however long we go. We're really thrilled that you're here. Thomas uh, is a Czech economist and a university lecturer, so he understands the world that James and I live in. We were just talking a little bit about that in the administrative hierarchy of universities. They're, they have some things in common. He's the chief macroeconomic strategist at CSOB, a former member of the National Economic Council of the Czech Republic. And the thing I think that just rocked me when James first told me about this was at age 24 became an economic advisor to President, President Havel. So we're very thrilled uh, to have Thomas here today. A couple of things that when you, you go out there and, and find out about him, he's referred to, he was in, a, in an article in the Econo Yale Economic Review as Young Guns, he's one of five hot minds in economics. So we have one of the five hottest minds here today with us. And his book, Economics of Good and Evil, has been a huge bestseller and has been translated uh, into multiple languages. We are thrilled to have you here today. It's my honor to introduce you, and I'm going to sit here and be a good student and learn more economics today. Thank you so much for being here. Join me in giving him a warm welcome. Thank you. Um, it's, it's a little bit humbling standing here in, in, uh, in Nebraska uh, to be speaking after uh, personalities whom I've always been looking up to. So uh, and once more time, thank you again for including me and being able to listen to you and to share my thoughts. I don't remember much of 1986 because I wasn't born. I wasn't even in, in the process of making. I, my parents weren't even uh, married or whatever you call it these days. So I, I would like to focus on, on um, a little bit, a bit like Petra focused yesterday on the events of 1989 and the transition from communism to, to capitalism. I feel um, somewhat aptly suited for it because I was one of the few Czechs that could live outside of the communist regime and not be a, 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 a son or daughter of some communist apparatchik because my father worked for Czech Airlines. So since the age of four weeks, I've been spending my, my time in, um, in airplanes and in airports. And I had to explain to my Finnish friends how it works in, in, in Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia those days under the communist regime. So uh, at the age of six or seven, I have involuntarily become an economist because I had to explain to them how is it possible that in Czech Republic the same bottle of milk costs the same price everywhere. And then coming back to Czech Republic for, or Czechoslovakia for brief visits, I had to explain to my Czech friends how is it possible that the same bottle of milk costs differently in different places. So I had to come up with terms like competition and they said, what do you need competition for, etc, etc, etc. And also I had to become sort of a theologian because the same problem was in the theological grounds was also Czech Republic being an extremely atheist country all the way till today, by the way. Uh, it's the most atheist country in Europe, which pretty much makes it the most atheist country in the world. And fin Finland was the contrary. So in Finland I had to explain that I, my friends don't believe in God, and my Finnish friends were knocking their foreheads and said, what sort of idiots do you, do you live next to? And then in Czech Republic, I had to do exactly the same in reverse, and my Czech friends were saying, what sort of idiots do you live uh, around? I even remember I had to 
promise to my Finnish friends that they wouldn't believe me that there is such a person as a non-believer. So uh, I said, well, next time the embassy people come to my parents for visit, I promise to show you um, Anna, and she is for sure atheist, and you can look at her and touch her if she allows you to. So uh, that was before the Me Too movement. And uh, so that happened. They really they made a big procession in front of our house when, when Anna came around. Uh, 1989 was, was, a, was a, the most emotional moment for me. I am really the last generation that remembers it. Uh, my brother, who is four years younger, remembers nothing of it. So when today we come into a pub with my brother and I say, I don't like it here, it's too communist, my brother looks at me and says, what do you mean? I don't understand. And so uh, I, I was 14, 13 when the revolution came about. So my, my father actually took me to all these uh, revolutionary days in Wenceslav Square where there was an army and my father always was trying to buy a hot dog that was a trick to get into the Wenceslas Square and he always when he was dealing with the army or with the policemen and there were almost tanks everywhere he always told me remember this remember this remember this It'll be important later and I was standing there with my hot dog not really knowing on what's 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 going on but but um, just to give you a little bit of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, feel, uh, it was the strongest moment that I remember was the sort of the unexpected intelligence of the crowds. So um, when uh, the communist apparatchiks were going around the country trying to rally support in their most likely bases, those were the heavy working uh, industry, the miners and the heavy iron uh, works and steel works, um, I remember he had this big speech uh, in, in front of the the sort of hard-working uh, proletariat, uh, as we would call them those days. And uh, the chairman of the Communist Party was saying, you know, these people on the streets, these children, they can't tell us what to do. We can't have this country run by small children. And the crowd, it didn't take the crowd two seconds to chant back in unison as one person Immediately screaming back at the, uh, at, the, at, at the chairman, we are no children. And that's an answer that I think it would take a playwright a week or two to come up with. And this crowd, who is usually judged that crowds, anyway, this is what sociologists tell us, that, that crowds usually act the lowest intelligence of the group. This wasn't really the case in, in, um, in, in Czech Republic at that, at that time. It was also interesting that um, uh, what happened, which I think happens in, in all transitions, is when you want to change from one level of order to a higher level of order, and this I, uh, I, I suppose works in management uh, of companies as well, is that the, tra the pathway is never straight up. It's a, it's a sort of a reverse J-curve, rather. So if you're cleaning your room from one level of order, which is, to me, very clear, but the surrounding world doesn't understand my level of order, and if I'm usually forced by an outside compulsion to upgrade the level of order in the room, and if I stopped cleaning in the middle of the cleaning, the room is messier than when we started. So also in this hall, if you choose to repaint it from this beautiful whitish color to some color that you find superior, in the middle of the painting, the room is messier and it's actually useless. So the idea is you do your transformation, your transitions as fast as possible. Also, what we've learned in management theory is that you should have a fallback strategy. So in case the transformation isn't successful, some unexpected event happens, you should have a fallback strategy, usually falling back to the last functional system, which, by the way, is one way how to read the political situation today. We're trying to fall back to the last functional uh, political system, being a little bit tired of globalization. We're sort of falling back on the idea of uh, supremacy of a national state. But during the early 90s, this was exactly what we didn't want uh, to do. So we were deliberately burning the bridges. So there was no fallback strategy, and this was a very deliberate uh, idea. During the early 90s, when I still was a student, well, the, the predominant debate among the, uh, among the university people 
and our professors was that there is a sort of a hill of resistance. If you're transferring from one level of order to another level of order, it doesn't go downhill, it goes, there's like a hill in the middle. So if you're going from communism to capitalism, you have to give the ball enough of inertia, you have to sort of hit it with enough force so that the ball gets at least here, just in case the stormy weather arrives and we have to let go of our hands, the ball wouldn't roll back to this old functioning system. So, so these two, this two sort of tools of logic were there in advance or in advocacy of a shock therapy, which of course had many critiques, but um, this was the main argumentation that it has to be A, burning the bridges behind us and B, giving the, uh, the system enough of force so that the inertia gets at least behind the tipping point so that if things go sour, we at least end up in, uh, closer to the, uh, to the um, desired location. Now, as for the debate that I think Petra very interestingly started yesterday, where is she? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna, yeah. So, of course, this is, this is my big topic, and uh, th this, these are things that I've been thinking about for, for years, as, as, as all of us, and uh, I'd like to think a little bit about the third way. I think that's maybe one way how to approach. Um, why didn't we develop something new? And I think this was, and again, I will stand corrected by especially my uh, American and Western friends, but I think the West was expecting that of us, a little bit. Uh, uh, show us, guys, um, Havel and others, you are well equipped to do this. You have a uh, um, high level of education. You have a history of democracy. You have intellectuals, both, let's say, Václav Klaus and Václav Havel, who till today, I would say, are symbols of uh, two ways or two approaches of doing it. I remember back in the 90s, there was even a prayer uh, because the patron, some Catholics that we have believe in, in, in patrons of, of a nation. So the nation, the patron of a Czech nation is Saint Venceslas. And the prayer was, thank you Venceslas for giving us two Venceslas. It's a strange name for you to pronounce, I know. We call it Václav, Venceslav, but most Americans call it Václav. So whichever is your pick. Um, so the prayer was, thank you, Venceslavs, for these two Venceslavs, for giving us sort of this balance. And this balance wasn't kept for, for very long. Um, there really, I think this was a little bit of a disappointment to, to the West. Um, I know that uh, the way the West was looking at the communist Czechoslovakia from an economic point of view, that it was, uh, it was taught in, uh, in the classes of comparative studies and Czech Republic and other communist countries were looked at as a, well, you know, laboratory. Is there an alternative to capitalism from which we can learn? It also should be remembered here that in 1968, when we had um, uh, the anti-Soviet uh, riots, there were actually pro-communist riots in the western parts of Europe, especially in, in, in Paris and in France. So there was this sort of uh, misunderstanding, and um, this is also why, except for the Austrian school, there was little thought developed to what to do once the regime falls or crumbles down. Um, in the beginning, when the regime was quite successful, there was even some quite strong voices from Western economists that they were sort of going uh, thumbs up to the system. And there really was uh, no cookbook. We didn't know what to do. Uh, when, uh, when, where do you go to, to, to buy capitalism? What, what sort of things do you add first? There's a famous poem by Seamus Heaney, I believe, the Irish poet, called Instant Fish. And don't worry, it's not long. It just only has one line. It's called, add water and they swim. So this is sort of what we, uh, what we thought might work. Just add water, uh, say the word abracadabra, capitalism, and it's just somehow, well, the fish start swimming. So, um, so uh, the, the third way didn't really materialize, but not because of um, uh, lack of uh, will, but it was really an intellectual, uh, intellectual lack, which I think we are lacking till today, actually, quite frankly. If you look at Greece, uh, what now, six years ago when Syriza won the uh, quite unexpected elections that had really very little to do with the uh, economic crises. They were rather uh, constitutional, rather a constitutional crisis, where um, a, a quite strong power was given to the left. 
um, with Varoufakis and, and others. I'm quite sure you have been following the situation. And uh, everybody said, okay, well, you know, why don't you go ahead and try your hand? Of course, to be fair, it was already a shipwreck situation from, from most parts, and now go and try your steering at a shipwrecked uh, sort of um, uh, situation where you are already in an impasse. But even there, uh, the left, or let's even say the communist left, because that's how I think Syriza would even identify themselves, they were really come, unable to come up with, um, with a uh, solution to, that would be in any way credible to, to their own voters and to the international community. So, um, but there was actually a, a sort of a third way um, in, in, in Havelian thinking. There was a third way in, in democratic thinking. It was, um, it was this sort of non-partisan democracy, which I will come back to later because I think this idea can be revisited in an, on a global scale. On a planetary scale, uh, I think we could have non-partisan um, uh, democracy because uh, well, democracy has always been linked with a nation state. Uh, but back, there, uh, back then, the idea uh, didn't last for long. When it comes to economics, there actually was a very minor school of thought in, uh, that mainly developed in um, uh, northern former Yugoslavia, what we know today as Slovenia, and it was, um, it was something that was called then back in the day democratic capitalism. And the main idea was that the owners of, uh, sorry, the workers of the company become the owners of the companies. So in Czech Republic, we adopted the, the infamous, fam famous voucher privatization, which was a sort of a, uh, yeah, it, the idea was that uh, the government gets rid of its property, but, but who do you sell it to when nobody has money? So the only people who had money, you can't auction it really, because uh, you can't auction, let's take, I don't know, my favorite example of, I don't know, beer. Yeah, so you can't really sell the whole brewery to to a nation of 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 of, of, nothing, of have nothings. Ninety eight percent of Czech GDP was actually government owned. We were more uh, Catholic than the Pope, so to speak. We were the most we were the most um, um, uh, communist country of all communist countries or real socialist countries. So the only people who had money were people who were either stealing from the regime or people who were uh, political apparatchiks or foreigners. And there was very little will to, to do the path of Hungary, Hungary, which was quite readily sell capital to, to, to capitalists. It doesn't really matter whether they're Greek, Chinese, or, or Indian. By the way, who owns the majority share in Coca-Cola? Who knows today and who cares? It's not a big deal. It's not actually an American company, although it looks like it. It hadn't had an American management for a long time, and nobody cares. But back there in the day, it somehow, for, for reasons um, that may be more understandable today than they were 10 years ago, mattered. So the idea was that we create artificial money, artificial markets, by not giving money out to people, but giving vouchers. It was actually a very communist idea that everybody uh, should start have exactly the same amount of money or voucher. So everybody who was 18 plus had 1,000 points, vouchers, that you could sort of invest into any company and then there was three rounds of licitations and at the end of the day you ended up with 2% of Pilsner. And the voucher privatization wasn't such a bad idea looking back in these days, but it had nowhere to land. We didn't have capital markets. There were this, the idea of voucher privatization was couple fold, and one of the biggest advantages was that it would create capital markets out of thin air. Because we, in continental Europe, we rather rely on banking when you need to finance a firm. So an American company or uh, Anglo-American company rather relies on capital markets for its financing traditionally or stereotypically, if you will, while a continental German type companies rather go to, and this is also the case of Japan, they rather finance themselves from, from banks. So it wasn't even in our tradition to have very strong capital markets. But, but the capital markets were not ready. So for those of you who study economics and are interested in, uh, in, in, in whether spontaneous markets work or not, this was actually sort of a laboratory. Czech Republic, alongside with our other, uh, other uh, nations, has become a laboratory. You guys had, what, 200 years to develop your rules of corporate governance. 
Back in the day, it was basically a sheriff rules. That's the first corporate governance rules, if you will. And then, as time went by, you had case after case, so you sort of you know, fine-tuned your rules until you came up with what you have. Today, and God knows as well as you do, that it still needs a little bit of fine-tuning, and we're still not sure whether we have the system functioning, because one of the nice things about the system is that you can't really tell whether it functions or not. You know, uh, it's a little bit, and I'll come back to this, in, in, the, in the year 2008, uh, it was clear that uh, the whole system of checks and balances in economics, uh, and this might be also true of politics and democracy, I'll come back to that later, but the whole idea uh, was that the, the, the system of checks and balances and, and uh, all sorts of very carefully weighed interest rates and securities and, and, and credit default swaps to make sure that you're very sure, and, and, and the whole system looked very certain. But the certainty, the uncertainty, sorry, moved from a, a, a business person vis-a-vis -vis his or her company. There was almost no uncertainty in owning risk because you could insure that. So the, uh, so the uncertainty moved from this to the, to the system itself, resulting in creation of a system uh, which a little bit reminds one of a, um, uh, let's say, an umbrella that works always and flawlessly and it's a great umbrella and will protect you from everything except for when it rains. Or you can also think of a car with a, uh, with a um, airbag system that works flawlessly with one single exception. You guessed it, car crashes. Yeah, so, so um, uh, okay, now let me uh, so stop here telling you about how privatization works. Let me just finish by an example, which I think is precious even for today. We created a market, but we didn't create any landing zone. We didn't create regulation because the idea from the Austrian school, which is tending to be very sort of liberal or even libertarian, was the market will settle its rule itself. It's, it's, I remembered having this debate with Václav Klaus, and he said, you know, when you play tennis, you also first don't study the rules, you start playing the tennis, and then you fiddle around the rules later as you go. And I, as a young student, remember raising my hands and saying, hey, what about chess? Do you also start moving stones around, the, you know, before there is actually a uh, cup, cardboard, I mean, uh, chessboard? So, you know, it depends what, what, game, what game you pick as, as your example. Now, let me, uh, uh, let me say that this, the answer to this question was, was a little bit hard to say. Another experiment which, exp which sort of will test whether we can organize ourselves spontaneously without governments is actually the Internet. The Internet could be a good case study. I, I would like to see a, a thesis written on that. Um, the, the, government, the, the Internet that is actually taxless, that is actually governmentless. that is the rules on the on internet are sort of optional. I mean, we have rules, but you know, everybody can work, work around them quite well. And we do have really good examples of the internet actually serving greatly. And you know that if you have a small little problem with the back of your car, that is 1968 special edition, you go on YouTube, you press two clicks and there's gonna be 10 videos on how to fix whatever, your ex exhaust pipe. So, so there's actually good examples of altruism and people are not being really paid for that. Um, but there's also the dark side, the dark net, the, the, the id, the, the sort of the um, psychological shadow of, of internet. So there's even a whole new personality being born as we speak today. Would you call internet uh, an organization or an organism? I, you know, I'd, I'd say that it's rather, I don't know, it's rather resembles uh, an organism rather than um, the, an, an organization. So, um, uh, the Czech capital markets almost bankrupted, not one fund, but the whole idea of markets because we started tunneling. It was also interesting to look in terms of numbers. In the beginning, in the, beginning the numbers looked really good uh, because people in totalitarian regimes are very much more following the rules than in, in freer regimes because, well, there are the punishments in, in, in totalitarian regimes are usually much more uh, severe and uh, the judgment takes really shortly. We just had Easter and it was only in my 41 years of age that I realized that Jesus was sentenced and crucified in 24 hours. Imagine the paperwork that it would take today. Uh, but then it was, it was uh, yeah, Green Thursday, then so they caught him, and the next day around that time he was already crucified. 
and he had two or three, three courts to actually go to, the Jewish court, Pilate, and, and Herodas. And somehow they managed to do that in, in, in 24 hours, and it was done. So there are actually advantages to slow bureaucracy from that example. Um, so now, the, 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 the brutal question which I want to come to is, would, have, would communism have communism... Uh, would, it, would it have ever fallen if it would have given us 7% of GDP growth annually? That's the Chinese question. And uh, not anymore, but a couple of years back, I got this from very many business people all over Europe, uh, and even in America when I was talking about this. Um, the question was, well, shouldn't we learn from the Chinese? Look, how, look at their rates of growth, it's almost double digit. And, you know, we are so slow. The famous example of the um, uh, airport in Heathrow, it was the second or third terminal when they were starting to build that terminal in London. Before they even got the paperwork done, uh, the airport in Shanghai, which was thought of at pretty much the same time, the idea was born pretty much the same time, uh, planes were already landing and they were you know, water fountains in, in Shanghai already functioning, and um, our English friends didn't even get through the paperwork. Yeah, because it's quite clear. Uh, a totalitarian wakes up one morning and says, okay, we need an airport, and in the afternoon, just like in the case of Jesus, there's actually already bulldozers, bulldozering the villages away and whatnot. Nobody has um, sort of way to object to that. So there was certain fascination of our let's say, bureaucratic and democratic and, and, and caring and all these sort of rules of, 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 of uh, the greens and stuff. Um, so the real question is, what caused the fall of 1989? Was it economic reasons or was it political reason? Was it rather freedom? Would we be ready to sacrifice certain amount of freedom like they do in China? I mean... The, the way the system functions there is, okay, we'll give you growth and you shut up about the political executions that we still do till today in our stadiums. We, well, basically sacrifice all the political prisoners by shooting them, but you will get 8% of GDP growth, and China seems to be pretty, pretty um, okay with that. Um, uh, hard to say what was the main motive of 1989? Was it an um, economic uh, motivation to be like the West, like we heard today, the, the question? Or was it rather a struggle for freedom? I am firmly convinced that it was the second, but then again, I am, as I'm learning again and, and again, I'm not the majority of uh, even, my own, my, even my own country. So, um, uh, the, the question of whether we can compare capitalism and communism, which was raised, I think, quite, quite bravely and quite well yesterday. Uh, and I always, in my lectures, I, because I compare European Union with the United States of America, uh, and I say, I am fully aware that e EU is not the same like United States of America. That's why I can compare it. People say you can't compare oranges with op uh, apples and oranges, and actually that's the only thing that you can compare. Orange is orange and apples are green and red. I just did. I just compared apples and oranges. And in fact, that's what you do most of the time. And then always somebody asks a question, oh, but you can't really compare because America is not Europe. I said, yeah, that's exactly why I'm comparing it. You can't compare the same. Nobody compares one with one. You, know, you compare one with two or one with half. One is double the size of half and one is half of two. But one is not two just because when you're comparing something, you are not saying that it's the same by no means. So let me, let me um, uh, ask a second provocative question. One way how to look on our system, which I would call liberal democracy, for lack of a better word, because it's not liberal, it's, well, anyway, is that it's actually somewhat of a miracle, if you think about it historically, that from a clash of two totalitarian regimes, which today we call extreme right, Nazism or fascism, with extreme left, which is communism, from a clash of those two systems, the remaining particle was liberal democracy. It's like the hydron, Large Hydron Collider, two great systems were sort of clashed together and the remaining particle was quite surprisingly not, not totalitarian communism and not totalitarian Nazism either. It was actually sort of a sunny side, hippie-ish, almost meek, uh, caring, 
liberal democracy. And the irony about a liberal democracy is, and this is something that I find extremely interesting, is that we won over both of these systems in their own arms of choice. We won over Nazism with their weapon of choice, which was brute force. We actually beat it them in sort of fist fight, because that was their weapon of choice. Communism was beat it in terms of ideology. I mean, if you reread uh, some parts of Marx, which I don't recommend, it's just enough to read the Communist Manifesto if you are so inclined. Uh, for study reasons, it's a very short, it's like six, seven pages of, of, uh, of, of a manifesto. And in there, at the end of it, there, there is uh, uh, eight or ten sort of dreams that Marx and Engels have about what they want to do, what they want to achieve. And you take your pen, and you can actually crisscross it. It's like, you know, general insurance. Yeah, we've got that in Europe. And here now, too. Uh, I believe still. No, not anymore. Well, but in Europe, we sort of got that. Um, free education for everybody. Yeah, pretty much. In Europe, all the way to your university level. Here, all the way to... Uh, some degree of, of education. Uh, and you go one uh, requirement after another, and we in Europe can say, yeah, 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 we got that, without the revolution that Marx was saying. Because the basic idea of Marxism was that capitalism will never be nice. The, the, the sort of a easy example is um, that a capitalist will always try to take all the profit from its workers. If a capitalist uh, decides to give increased wages just because he or she is nice, so let's say, okay, I made this much profit, I will increase your wages by 20%, that person will go bankrupt next year because he will or she will not have enough return over capital, or not enough money to reinvest, etc., etc., etc. So this logic Marx used to say it has to be done by force. If one of them decides to be nice, the others will not follow, and this will lead to the collapse. So it's even sort of a vicious circle, vicious, not even beneficial circle like, like we know in business cycles, but a vicious circle. So there must be a revolution. It is not natural for the system, for the spontaneous system of capitalism, to produce these eight or ten outcomes that we, uh, that we want to do, and we want to achieve that by revolution. Today, we are living much better off than, uh, than any uh, that Marx even dreamed. So, why am I saying this? Nazism, we managed to beat in their own weapon of choice, which was brute force. Communism, our system of liberal democracy, managed to beat in their own weapon of choice, which was sort of welfare and, and, and prosperity. It's also... Uh, challenging to, um, um, when you compare these two systems, um, one of the most clearest ways of comparison for me is that capitalism does allow communist experiments. If you want to take your friends and you want to start a farm out there, not use money, not use electricity, not use social stratification, you're really welcome to do that. And everybody will, I think, applaud you and there'll be articles and movies and documents written about you and nobody will really go around shooting you or, or, or putting you to prison. The other, way, the, other, the other thing, on the contrary, was not allowed. It was not welcome. You could not have a capitalist experiment in the middle of communism. So there, these systems are comparable, but the comparison, of course, shows quite, 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 uh, quite clearly. So now, um, uh, also... Um, um, one way of, of looking at this is, um, is uh, the, the crises that we had during the communist time. So that's, that's um, uh, another topic, I would say. We had crises of communism, and we know in economics we divide everything on demand and supply. So uh, during communism we had crises of uh, supply. Uh, we wanted uh, r um, razor blades. The demand was fine, it was ready, there was hunger, but there were no razor blades. The supply side simply was collapsing all the time because the whole idea of communism was it was a monopolistic uh, system. Why monopolistic? Because the ideas of Marx was that there's so much waste in, in, in competition, so much energy put in mutual fighting, that it would be better if we all do this. It's, there's actually one company that produces razor blades because we pretty much know how many razor blades we need, so we all put that 
to those many companies. We save a lot of money on advertisement. We save a lot of money on, on and there will be huge, we call this um, econo economies of scale, which means that if you're making one car in the factory, that car is gonna cost you billions of dollars. If you make 100 cars, it's gonna be much cheaper. If that same company makes million cars, the average cost of a single car goes dramatically down. So the larger your company is, the cheaper the average price of, uh, of the car is. So that's why communism was monopolizing companies. So the basic idea was that this sort of clash, this fighting, this competing, is a waste of energy. We should put all our energy into making cars or razor blades. We shouldn't fight each other, we should be nice. In theory, that's how it sounded. That's the, that's the ideology, the argumentation behind, behind monopolization. Um, um, but uh, but, but this, this was faltering all the time. You remember this much better than I, but I still remember there was a summer where we didn't have sugar. It was really random and unpredictable. That was the whole trick, that it was unpredictable. And um, you know, as a Boy Scout, we were running around town buying sugar. And that was the task. And there were no razor blades, and there also was no toilet paper. Uh, and I'm quite sure you'd be able to come up with more better examples. Uh, I remember, though, that in the time where we <laughs> didn't have toilet paper, my uh, parents were saying that that was the only time that newspapers were actually useful. So, uh, so uh, to give sort of a, uh, an example from, from, from a, a more common experiences, um, people were hungry, the demand was there, but there was nothing to eat. The table was, so to speak, empty. That was a typical situation of a communist country. Um, um, on the contrary, the crises that we see in our day and our time in, in capitalist or liberal democracies are uh, crises of demand. The problem is exactly uh, opposite. There are enough cars, there are enough razor blades, you can get out of here and in five minutes I bet you'll be able to get maybe 10, maybe seven different types of razor blades according to your preference of, I don't know what, sharpness. And you can even get five of them in one go. It's crazy. I mean, the amount of choice is even, even, um, uh, even you, you can make jokes out of that. So the supply is fine. We have more than we want, but we don't want. It's not the problem to produce a certain number, a number of cars. The problem is to sell them. So here today, we are in, in, in a sort of an opposite problem. Uh, the table is full of food, but we have, we're not hungry. I don't know if anybody of you saw the, the disturbing French movie. Oh, sorry, that's a, <laughs> that's a redundance. If you saw the French movie, uh, <laughs> Le Grand Buff. Uh, I don't know, anybody? Yeah, there you go, yeah. So, Velka Zranice in Czech. And there, there's a movie of, of um, gluttonous French, again, maybe <laughs> redundant, um, but sorry for that. Um, <laughs> my, my cousin's French, so I can make fun of that. Um, uh, they, they, were, they decided that they will die by overeating. And I remember one very disturbing scene in the movie is one man was completely full and couldn't eat anymore, and they had these some sort of delicacies. And the other comes to him and says, come eat, they're really nice. And he starts praising the quality of the food, how it was picked during the full moon and whatnot. You hear that today a lot in restaurants. And the guy said, no, really, I can't. And then this other guy starts telling him about poor people in India who are dying from hunger. And we were sort of importing their hunger psychologically to continue our gluttony. And I don't know if your parents did that to you. Yeah, they did? Okay, same here. My grandmother, this was really brutal. My grandmother, bless her heart, she would open a book of concentration camp kids and put that sort of in front of me and say, come on, look, you should be grateful for, you should eat more because use their hunger for your, for your, for your gluttony, which is as perverse an image as you can imagine, but from your head nods, head nods? Nodding heads, not have nots, but head nots. I, uh, I, I understand that this is a common experience. So, so this is, I would sort of say, this is what's, what's happening um, in terms of the, the crises of capitalism and the crises of communism. Now, um, uh, one other way to look at the situation today, which I think is quite difficult to read, but, but, but this is the task of, of us 
readers to, to read the situation around us, is that what happened in um, 1989, of course, there was a very famous book called The End of History, which I think was a little bit maybe over-criticized, uh, and it does till today deserve some respect, if for nothing else, for being still quoted. Uh, and the idea was that the great ideological crash between communism and capitalism was, was won. There is no single happy communist country today, except for North Korea. Which, by the way, I think, uh, if you want a country where people love their politicians, go to North Korea. I think the tears when the older one died, uh, those are genuine tears. People really, really, really loved him because... Yeah, he was a demigod, virgin born, by the way. He's a little bit like um, Chuck Norris. He was sort of born in the hut that he himself built by his bare hands. But, uh, but people really, really, really love their leaders in totalitarian countries. In free liberal countries, they usually despise their own leaders, which is interesting because... because uh, um, there has never been a time where you could voice your opinion so audibly as you do today, yet people have a genuine feeling of not being able to speak. There is never a time where politicians were so lip-reading the wish of, its, of their own people as today. Read through the history of Western civilization. The leaders usually didn't give a care about what the people think or what the people want, because that's why you are the boss, the feudal leaders, the kings, exceptionally paid attention. Those were the good kings, like our Charles IV. But otherwise, it was not your duty to do to care about whether your people are happy or not. Your duty was to make your country large or to make your family prosperous, etc., etc. So there was never a government that would be so lip-reading the, the, the whims of its population. Even today, we have a, a, a populism. We have a special name for that. That's a new feature. Populism is only possible in democracy, by the way. Uh, as we have today, yet people feel that their leaders are detached, far, foreign, distant, unapproachable, and going their own, their own path. There's never been a time where transparency was so cheap and easy and actually quite readi readily available, thanks to internet and to all the NGOs, as today, and yet fee people feel uh, uh, they, they can't see through. They can't, even I can't read the system anymore. Uh, and I'm paid to do that, or sort of paid. Well, yeah, I'm sort of... I get bed and lodging for that, which, yeah, sort of amounts to being paid. Uh, so, uh, and there was another example of, uh, that it's never, there's never been a time where, uh, where you really literally could elect your voter, your, your leaders, and, and give them your voice, and yet, yet there's also never been a time where so massive demonstrations. Which leads me to a second point. Um, what we managed to do in this great idea of uh, uh, the last man and the end of history, it seems to me that when it comes to liberal um, democratic capitalism or, uh, or free market democracy, there are two things in that system. Capitalism or social capitalism, whatever you want to call it, and democracy. Two systems which are actually more independent than we thought. I remember when I was a student of your age, they were always teaching that these two things go hand in hand, like love and marriage. Yeah, love and kind of It's this marital sex. I really enjoy that. Uh, uh, it's also the hardest. Um, yeah, so these two things, market democracy and, uh, sorry, market capitalism and democracy, are more independent than we thought. And what we managed to do since 1989 is, I think we managed to export capitalism really well, pretty much everywhere, but export of democracy, not so good. And this is, of course, illicit question. I just leave that to disturb your falling asleep process. If you could choose out of these two systems, which one would you export rather? Would, you, would it be democracy and freedom of expression, freedom to travel, tolerance, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, being able to be free, or being able to be rich? Would you rather export democracy? Would you rather, if you had a magic wand uh, and you could have one wish fulfilled, would it rather be a democratization of the world 
or would it rather be a capitalization of the world? And again, I leave that question burning, I hope, as a splinter in your head, because that, in fact, is the role of intellectuals, is to put a splinter in your head. Is, I also think this is the role of art, not to make things more beautiful or more ugly, but to put a splinter in your head. That painting, why did I love or hate? So, um, so what you see is, again, in Arabic countries with the Arabic Spring, whether it was a disappointment or not is a good question to ask. Uh, in my uh, understanding, it majorly was a disappointment, but again, I'm not trying to, trying to push that on you. We've managed to export, or capitalism managed to export itself to Russia and to, and to, and to Africa and to Latin America. Democracy, not so much. I would even claim that Czech Republic alongside with our neighbors, let's call that Central and Eastern Europe, uh, is about the only region where the export or re-export of democracy actually went reasonably well. We are members of the European Union, some of the countries are even using Euro as their currency, and we are sort of legitimate uh, members of the debate uh, as, as, as long as we enjoy it. So, uh, so in terms of capitalism, we westernized the East. But in terms of democracy, I'd say West got Easternized. We now, in my country and in other countries, understand democracy rather as a means of getting to power rather than means of steering the country. We don't understand democracy according to what I see majority vote. We don't understand democracy as the process in which the best ideas are chosen and your opponents are appreciated because it's written so also somewhere in the Bible in the Old Testament, in the book of Proverbs, actually, that iron sharpens iron. This is, I think, exactly, iron is not sharpened by wax or by clay. You need iron to sharpen iron. You need somebody sharp to sharpen you. And that's, to me, the whole idea of democracy. Iron sharpens iron, and thank you for correcting me. And it's important, especially in humanities, where we don't have a laboratory, when we don't have reality to slap us back into our faces and correct our theories. We don't have that, so we have to talk. We have to talk a lot, because I rely on you to depict the bad splinters in my head and to correct my opinion. And if you do so, I will love you forever and ever and ever, because you've served me. You've corrected me. You've made my view better. You. You, 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 you took a splinter out of, or a, a whole log out of, my, out of my eyes. So it would be a little bit, and I hope the, the, uh, what I'm going to say now is, is not in any way insulting, but um, it's just that democracy is the fashion today. If it be 200 years ago, those would be warlords, because that's how you got to power 200 years back. But today, we don't do that anymore, uh, so it's rather a democracy and market manipulation, whatever weapons are sort of allowed, we're going to use because we get to power. Once we get to power, we, 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 we insult our opponents, etc., etc., etc. Now, you tell me whether what to do with a nation and whether it is a collapse of democracy when, uh, and you can please check this out, um, uh, there is this thing, I don't know if you do this in the United States of America, but in Europe we do this. From time to time we happen to elect the biggest Czech and the French elect the biggest French, and I don't know, do you do this here? Americans electing the biggest, it happens once five years, just like the elections, but it's, those are not the elections, it's just a popular survey where people get to send their favorite checks. So when it comes to checks in, uh, in 2012, five years ago, um, uh, Zimmermann won. Yeah, Zimmermann you will not know because he's a fictional, non-existent character, a very funny inventor who always came second. He was famous in, uh, in discovering blind alleys, which is, of course, as you know, for science, very, very important because simply there's nothing there and nobody else has to inquire. But Czechs uh, elected this guy, which then was ruled out by our much more boring British colleagues who invented the whole uh, idea of finding the best Czech. But now the sad news comes, you know who, ro who won in Russia in, in 2017? The biggest Russian and Russians were electing the biggest historical Russian. Yes, correct. Joseph Stalin, the murderer who murdered his own people. But, you know, he had a mustache. Or what? This 
also happened in the year 2012. Five, this was uh, Stalin won 2017, year back. Guess who was second? Yeah, that was, he was third. That's correct. Vladimir Putin was second. Uh, and he even won this, I think, a couple of years back. Um, and in the year 2012, Stalin got 42%. It's an easy number to remember if you know Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. 42 is usually your answer to pretty much everything. So Stalin, sadly, got 42% of Russian votes, second to none. Second was like 28% or something. So it was a very, very clear, clear much history. So Putin combined with Stalin uh, would make the perfect rule. Talking about Russia, also one must bear in mind that communism never crumbled in Russia. There was now no revolution against communism. We had a small revolution, Paul had a small revolution. Luckily, nobody was murdered, but it was quite dangerous. I remember the beatings, and um, till today I have goosebumps when I think back to that time uh, when, when hippie power flower won over um, uh, heavy guard, he heavily armed policemen who were just a second from, from the orders of, of, of shooting and the dogs and, and, and the gasoline in the air and, 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 and the immense electricity of, of hope combined with fear that no movie can ever uh, uh, make in, in, inside of you. It's also interesting, I don't understand how we did that without Facebook and Twitter and we didn't even have cell phones. And yet the crowds knew exactly what to do. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was amazingly energetic. It's also funny, and I wanted to thank you, especially in name, because we Czechs, when you invited me here to come to celebrate the Prague Spring, I thought to myself, well, that happened in summer. That was, that was the summer events, until I realized, no, 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 that was the end of summer, uh, of Prague Spring. And that's what we celebrate in Czech Republic till today. We don't actually celebrate Prague Spring in the spring. We celebrate that, the invasion that quenched the Prague Spring and, 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 and made, it, made, it, made it over. So, um, so yeah, so you have this, uh, you have this situation where, where, and is that a fault of democracy? The people really genuinely, uh, we would say brainwashed, but that would be too easy a solution. The other solution is that people really actually enjoy this style of politics. It was very difficult for me to understand until, uh, until Brexit happened. And until Trump happened, I mean, to me, it was very, very, very sort of difficult to understand. How am I ex to explain to my students that United States of America, with a Republican president who is a, re a sort of right-off Republican, I mean, Republican Party is too left-leaning to him from my, and forgive my European reading of, of your politics, we shouldn't meddle, but then again, I'm not a diplomat, so I can. Um, and uh, yeah, how can, uh, that, that China today is a bigger proponent of free trade than the United States of America. Yeah. Uh, so um, how much more time do I have? Oh, see, I'm good at this. So, um, uh, the, the thing with competition is put three children in the room, they start competing in something. And actually, if you realized, uh, and we even compete in stupid things like dancing. We have this dancing contest. What's it called uh, in TV? Dancing with the Stars. Yeah, like when, since when was dancing supposed to be a competitive thing? Or skiing, or skating, or I don't know, beauty contest. I just learned that you have Czechoslovakian beauty contest not far from here. Since when was beauty made to be competed with? But yet, we, and nobody's forcing us, there's no, no bad, evil capitalist forcing you to compete. And in fact, if you think of the way we play games, games are an interesting example. Games always begin in a sort of a communist dream. Complete equality. You got this, a monopoly is a good example. Same number of money, everybody, uh, and the dice is fair. So it starts in, in sort of, communist ideal, but the very point of the game is to end in what? In Monopoly. That's where the name of the game comes from. Now, um, it would be extremely unfair if when you are fully grown, at, at the age of 18 or 21, you would play such a Monopoly game once in your life and then you would win, for example, and the rest of us would be cleaning your shoes and you would be giving us funny paper money. 
also realize the value of the funny paper money are, are, is valuable in Monopoly only as long as the game lasts. You would kill for those little fun paper money while the game is on, but then when the game is off, everybody knows that it's just funny paper money. So the whole system has to be done in a way so that uh, people want to play again. The, 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 the idea is to start equal, but the idea is not to end equal. That would sort of make sports irrelevant. It would make music, well, music. Music is a different, but in, even in music you have competitions. You have the best CD and you have the best, best band. And the whole idea is to make the system such so that everybody wants to play again, so that the game is fair. But, um, but uh, let me end here with, with a great hope. We are forgetting one great Czech here who is uh, sort of a comedian. Also, Václav Havel talked about this. If you want to make, when he was here, accepted by your congressman in the, in the joint session in 1980, this was many times remembered here, they asked him, what can we do to help you? And I'm quite sure you, Jack, and others remember his answer. And he said, if you want to help us, help Russia. And um, uh, I'm a great fan of theoretical physics. This is sort of a, 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 a tendency for which I apologize. But there is a Kardashev scale in, in, in theoretical physics judging the advance of a civilization according to the use of energy that they use. Uh, civilization type 1 can harvest the energy of the entire planet. Civilization type 2 can harvest the energy of their nearest sun, uh, star, which is, our, in our case, the sun. Civilization type 3 can harvest the whole galaxy, which is the sort of energy you need if you want to do Star Trek and, and Star Wars. Now, guess which planetary uh, uh, type, uh, civilizational type, is our planet? Say it out loud. Zero. Zero point seven eight seven. Physicists, just like economists, like to have things precise. Uh, so why am I torturing you with this? Well, uh, the Kardashev scale uh, says that type one is a planetary organization. Type 1 is an organization which, uh, which has global rules. Just uh, realize that we are living in the year 2018, and we do not have one single planetary rule. We have suggestions. United Nations and World, 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 World Health Organization and whatnot. Suggestions, yes. Rules, not. Just imagine that I took your rules away and I made them into suggestions. Don't murder, but if he's real pain in the neck, then yeah, do it. But do it in a humane vein. Yep. Do it quickly and so that his kids are not watching. That wouldn't work. Even the fine people of the United States of America would turn into brutes, which is, there is a beautiful movie about that. Guys, please tell me that you've seen uh, The Purge. The girls say yes. Good. All right. Uh, well, anyway, uh, look, look at The Purge. It's actually a, a, movie, a, horror movie, a slasher horror movie about what happens when um, law is uh, dismantled for one day. You could do whatever you want to. So, and I'm going to close with this. Um, in 30, 40 years, this civilization will transition from type zero, which is a local type of organ civilization where green against blue and blue against red and Germans against Czechs and Czechs against Chinese and Chinese against Americans. And this planet will, according to physicists, which I, by the way, find the best polit political theory comes from physics, to my great surprise, one that I found anyway. And we will be a planetary civilization type one. Also, this is what I think, why I think we are overregulated at the level of governments, because we are trying to regulate things that should have been regulated on a global level. Uh, and we're doing that on a, in an appropriate level of regulation. What I'm saying is that our lo rules, our bureaucracy would be much, much smaller if it would be planetary. So I was very happy when, uh, when uh, your president uh, Donald Trump actually had this um, great uh, motto in his, in his uh, campaign. The campaign motto of Donald Trump was, when I heard it first, I, I rejoiced in my heart. This, let's make America great again. I thought to myself, wow, finally a politician who thinks a little bit type one. There is actually a huge Freudian slip of tongue in that motto. Did you ever spot it? Yeah, again, no, well, yeah, that's, that's wrong, but it's not a Freudian slip, I would say. There's, there's a bigger Freudian slip. Last time I checked, no country called America. So I'm thinking, oh my God, yeah, finally, somebody, a, a president of the United States of America, who wants to make America great again, including Canadians, Mexicans, Venezuela, 
Cuba, the whole continent of America. And I rejoiced in my heart that we finally have a president who understands this, that the only way how to make United States of America, because I think that's what he meant, maybe, yeah? The only way how to make United States of America great again is to make America great again. There will no peace here until there is no until there is peace in the Middle East. I'm sorry, you guys have become willy-nilly, willingly or unwillingly, you've become the consciousness and also the policeman of the world. So you will not rest in peace if there is one human being who's actually suffering from hunger, and that's the great thing about this wonderful country. So uh, let's maybe hope, and this is absolutely in line of thinking of Václav Havel, and also one other Czech great name who has not been mentioned yet, but he is mentioned here to my great, great happiness, um, Archimenes, who wrote a wonderful book called Panartosia, The Betterment and the Improvement of All Things. So um, let's hope, following personalities like that, somewhere in the future, that maybe one day we will be really able to vote for a politician who will, without a slip of tongue, say, let's make the world great for the first time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there time for uh, debate questions? Yeah. I'd welcome to critical remarks first, because those would be more valuable for me. And you can express the level of your criticism from one to 10. <laughs> Okay, sir, if you just wait a second. Do we have one mic or two mics? Just one. Okay, please. He, has, he is the yielder now. Um, you, you mentioned uh, that liberal democracy and Western culture checks all of the boxes of Marx's, Marx's and Engels' manifesto, yeah. and that uh, it actually offers a brighter conclusion than the manifesto. Yeah. How, do you, how do you reconcile this with the fact that capitalism has, in America, has created swaths of abject poverty where leaving people with no access to education, leaving them hungry with no housing and no health care? Yeah, that, I, I think that rather, is a great question. Uh, and uh, to be quite frank, it's, it's a very legitimate question. If you, if you look at what happened in the last 30 years, um, and I'm quite sure you are aware of this because I, I, I hear that in your question. Um, in the last 30 years, what sort of capitalism did for us, if you, if you plot the advantages and your income level, but don't think now about Americans only, think about the whole world. This is another thing that the communists always had, the proletariat of the whole world unite. Uh, who, so it looks like this elephant shape, you're familiar with this. So people who earned Zero are still earning zero. That would be the extremely poor, but a very small portion of population of the planet. Very, very, very poor people didn't gain anything in the last 30 years. Then there are the, 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 China, the Chinese, the Indian, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the, the India Indians, sorry, uh, and Latin America also partially. Uh, I mean, there were famines in, in Ukraine as well. And those were deliberate famines during, during communist regime. So, so the things you are describing are uh, unfortunately something that does happen, but it happened on both sides of the games, game. Anyway, I wish I don't use PowerPoint, but now I wish I had it. And then there is this back of an elephant, all these Chinese uh, uh, people rising dramatically out of poverty, uh, going up, and then it dips again, and it goes up. So it looks a little bit like an elephant with a, what do you call this, nose? No. Trump, Trump? Trunk. Trunk, okay, sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. My bad, me bad, me bad, me bad, sorry, sorry. Uh, so, you know, so the slip of a tongue is not only um, uh, for, for president elects. So uh, yeah, so the point is that a huge part of the globe gained tremendously. People who lived on $2, uh, 2.25, dollars a day have decreased radically. Uh, lifespan of, this, of, of an average human being on this planet went up unbelievably, uh, 15 years in the last, in the last three decades. Um, also, child mortality is going down every year annually by 4%. That to me is something to celebrate much, much more than some hideous increases in GDP in certain, certain rich countries, and we don't look at that. 
But then, so, so these people gained tremendously. Czech Republic would be somewhere here, Poland and others. Then there is a dip. And that's exactly the class that you're speaking of. It would be the, uh, the American working class. Uh, uh, so, so those didn't really gain. And then, uh, then the, the, the trunk, trunk, like in a car? OK, cool. Cool with me. <laughs> it's your language. Um, <laughs> uh, those would be the extra rich. Though that would be your 1% or 5% or actually. So that's, that's, the, that's the honest sort of a snapshot of, of who gained and who lost. So yes, there is a class of people who have not gained from the 30 years. But in average, the, 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 the living and dying people gained, gained tremendously. So yeah, good question needs to be addressed. I'm not saying, by the way, that the world is perfect. But, these, but people were literally dying. When was the famine in Ukraine? Six, yeah, yeah. Th those people were dying. These poor, impoverished American people who are really in need of help, in need of education, et cetera, et cetera, their situation is terrible, but they're not dying. And I'm, again, hard to compare, but you get my point. Yes, please. and the freedom. Yes. And so one student asked, how did this all happen? And Havel simply pointed to the six students he brought with him from Prague and said, they're the ones who did it, ask them. Ten years later, the president of South Korea came, and I remember he formulated it this way, the great benefit of democracy is that it brings prosperity. And I was wondering at the time, what happens when the prosperity disappears, do you still appreciate democracy so yeah. much? 10, 20 years later, you have in Europe and in America people who are economically better off according to the raw statistics, who then are feeling that it's failing them somehow. I'm thinking here of the people said in Czech Republic that Klaus and his party brought forced prosperity and they brought it with Thatcher capitalism, but without the safety net. Yeah. And so I don't know if that lacking safety net in some areas is enough to explain populism and its rise, or is it at least a factor? That's a very good question, sir. And um, what happened in 1990, and you can see this wonderfully in, 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 our, in our data, and as much as I criticize GDP, let's just use it now, because it, it, for, for this answer or for this question, it will suffice. Like I said, that when the system goes through a sort of a reverse J-curve, when you are upgrading from one level of system to another, this seems to be philosophically true. You have this in mythology as well. Um, uh, that ex that's exactly what happened to our GDP. Our GDP dipped. Uh, and there actually, when I, when I was listening to Petra yesterday, I remember, I don't know who, what his name was, maybe you will remember, but in 1990, there was an American singer or an intellectual visiting Czech Republic and he said, and I'm sorry, but it's a direct quote. This is the parallel he used. He said, you've been holding your, what's the polite way of saying shit? <laughs> stuff? Yeah. You've been holding your stuff, thank you, inside for 40 years. That stuff <laughs> needs to come out. And so there were warnings. Oh, and my mother and I were very angry at him. He said, how can you spoil our... Our, our enthusiasm. And in fact, if you actually listen to Václav Havel's first um, presidential speech, it wasn't a hippie, happy speech. It was a speech of only saying that I will not lie to you. This country is not flourishing, and it will not flourish. And even Klaus said very clearly, we have to, we say, tighten our belts. Um, so the, these warnings were in place, and, and we all knew that this, this dip will happen. It a little bit reminds me of uh, this example of uh, Moses in, in uh, going from the land of slavery to the promised land through 40 years of, of desert, where they're exactly the children of Israel were complaining ex exactly about the thing that I think you're, you are asking. Why don't we go back to Egypt, to the land of slavery, where we had pots of flesh, which they didn't, by the way. Uh, this is also sort of uh, another thing that we tend to have the better memories from, from, from things like that. 
And I think it was the, the, the brilliance of Moses, uh, as, as fictional as that character could have been, to explain that freedom is much more important than, than, um, than, than, than wealth. And the 40 years that these people had to spend on the desert, that's beautiful because the, the, the road from Egypt to, to what is today Palestine and Israel, Israel and Palestine, that's a two week trip max. And people used to do that all the time. Remember, Joseph would send his brothers back and forth like yo yo. Go back to your father to bring Benjamin and then and they would come up back in a couple of days, a couple of weeks. So it, it was even a known road. And so I think that was exactly the reason for this longitude, which goes against this shock therapy method, is you stay in poverty, you stay homeless, literally homeless, not homeless, homeless, like sleeping under the bridge, but homeless, homeless, uh, not even having the idea of a home, never even having one. You stay homeless till you get the point that you are not going to be rich in any other way except for wandering, wandering around. So. Um, so um, that's, 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 how I would, that's how I would answer if that was your first part of the question. Was there a second part to your question? Okay, thank you. Yes, please. If anybody else has a question, raise your hand ahead so that we can get to your microphone before, yeah. Okay, so in one part of your uh, speech, you mentioned this sort of uh, crisis of capitalism uh, when the, the supply is okay, but the demand is changing or is going through changes. Uh, I think it's, I'm not sure if there's a causal relationship or not, but it's given to the demographics, the millennials, internet, <coughs> sharing economy, and so on and so forth. But don't you think we are sort of uh, fighting these changing back, and we, are, we, are, we, are, we want to have this system we have right now. We don't want this, I don't know, capitalism 2.0, given the example that Airbnb is getting banned in some cities, as well as uh, uh, Uber. Yeah. I think Uber got banned last month in Bratislava. Yeah. Now, uh, in, in, in Prague, uh, the mayor, Ms. Krenačová, is facing a big pressure from the, from the lobby of the cab companies or the taxi, com taxi companies. Don't you think we are sort of holding on to this status quo we have right now? Yeah, great question. Uh, I'd, I'd what I see today that we are actually living through two tectonic changes. One tectonic change I touched on a little bit. This is the transfer from type zero to type one. By the way, GDP is a good example. Uh, GDP, is, as objective as it looks, it's actually a remnant of nationalism because it measures gross national product. We're no longer nationalist like the Nazi sort of sort, but we still, you know, that's why we measure it because we want to. We want to compare. It would be if we measured GDP of women versus men, which we could, which we basically do, but nobody gives a damn about these statistics. The, the news that you would read in Financial Times would be, okay, the GDP of males went down 4% again. Now, should the females be fiscally solidary with the men, and, you know, or sh should we make some incentives to make these men more, 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 more work harder? So, uh, uh, so that's one trend is, is globalization, or I either prefer the word planetization, trying to understand with each other. We're no, no, we're no longer racist when it comes to the color of skin, at least legally we're not racist, it's not allowed, it's against the law, thank God. But it's completely legal to be judging people according to the color of their passports. Simply, if you are a member of the European Union, you are welcomed to this and that, but if you happen to be a Syrian refugee, then we will not. Or if you, yeah. So, so that I think is yet another hurdle that I think is perhaps for your generation to, 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 to tackle. Also, I think what we had in Europe, this, uh, this refugee wave also here, that to me was a case study. That's a case study of much, much more bigger movement of nations which will happen most likely in the future. We, you might be refugees as you once were. We might be refugees as we once were. Let's take this as a case study, small case study, okay, a couple of hundreds of thousands of people, and let's come up with rules for the next one. No. We were unable to do that. So that's something, that's one tectonic change, going from zero to one. A how would democracy look like if it's actually not national but it's actually planetary? What sort of questions would we ask? I think it's a completely interesting, uh, interesting um, topic. Now, the other great change that I didn't have time to speak on today is digitalization. Uh, is actually a great movement of nations from here 
to some abstract new digital world that is actually habitable. All the abstract roles that we have in art, cinema, mythology, religion are functional but not inhabitable. They're, they're fictional. You can't live in the world of mathematics for more than half an hour if you're lost in it while calculating. I hope this happens to you sometimes. It's beautiful. Well, it's a little bit like when you read a book and you forget that you're that reader reading the book and you're a little bit there with Tom Sire and Huckleberry Fing having slightly racist comments at each other. <laughs> so that sort of a, that part of the soul is moving to, to here. This is actually, this is the wormhole. We carry it. This is the biggest neighbor. No longer a human being. Our biggest neighbor is this. Look at where we carry it. It's either close to our heart or in our pockets. Um, so, uh, so that is another great tectonic change that the world of abstractness has become habitable. And I have lectures about this on, on YouTube. That you're welcome to watch. Those are in English and in Czech. I understand that you are concerned with, with Karnachova, so you must be Czech. Um, so these two tectonic changes that have been building up for millennia are now sort of going up against each other. And what's happening very often, you can see that beautifully here with, in the case of Trump, is that instead of fighting digitalization, Oh no, let me put it this way. Uh, it, uh, he's fighting, and many politicians do the same, he's fighting digitalization with the weapons of the last warfare, which is nationalism. So instead of actually addressing the problem of millions of unemployed drivers, uh, he is building a wall. So um, I always say that a stupid New York taxi driver is afraid of cheap competition from, let's say, uh, Mexico. A clever uh, New York taxi driver is afraid of self-driving cars because that is the proper fear. That is the uncanny. Uh, there's this whole new useless class, as Harari calls it, that will be here and maybe you will already be graduating into a world where you, your skills and my skills will be useless. That's why I always say become philosophers <laughs> because that probably will never be solved. So. So, yeah, so that's why I think what was happening is we're fighting the, the, the challenge of digitalization with the weapons of, uh, of last warfare. Yeah, the comments are brief. The answers are the problem, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Because I, I, your explanation that uh, the, the cause of these en endemic shortages, uh, the, uh, the ca cause of these shortages is, is, is monopoly. But it, it would seem to me, like, if, if you're thinking about central planning, it would seem to me you have a finite number of male fa faces and a finite num number of human bums. Why are there, e even with monopoly, you should be able to produce enough toilet yeah. paper to satisfy yeah. the, the needs yeah. of the bum and blaze for the face, right? But that, so it's yeah, sorry. Okay. That is a great question. And uh, it actually comes from extreme right-wing economics, the sort of a tea party, which ironically behaves that hum uh, believes that human behavior is so perfectly mathematical modelable that you don't have to in include things like culture and sociology and whims, et cetera, et cetera. So again, here you see how the extremes unite perfectly because actually Nazi regime and communist regime, these two regimes I would compare. Yeah, I don't think it's really uh, comparable, the liberal democracy with communism. It was rather the extremes, like extreme right with extreme. But they were united in their planned economy because Nazis were using planned economy just like, the, um, that, just like in communist China and Russia till today. In Russia, oh, I didn't finish that thought. In Russia, uh, communism was, ne they didn't have Tiananmen in Moscow. In Russia, the system just happened to unfortunately collapse. They, they didn't want its collapse. They were very sad when it did. We did these revolutions and Chinese tried to do the revolutions. They were quenched in their case, not in our case, thank goodness. But this did not happen in Russia. But anyway, so I just, Sometimes I don't finish my thoughts at the expense of others better, I hope. Um, but yeah, the answer to your question, which I've been, of course, thinking about that since my youth, is that communism actually would only be possible after a certain period of capitalism because you would know your relative prices and you would know your demand and supply because you would know. But it would not be possible to have communism right from the beginning without capitalism. And also, this idea of we can plan it comes from the fact that, um, that human behavior has no freedom in it, which is irony because the extreme right 
uh, economic policy actually don't account for human freedom at all. It's based on the assumption of human freedom, ironically, but then in the models, it completely disappears. Human behavior is absolutely modelable. So uh, 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 let's say uh, an extreme, crazy social scientist uh, on the right wing would agree with uh, a mediocre communist uh, social planner. And he would use, they would use each other's models, ironically. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a great pleasure for me and a great enjoyment. Thank you, thank you.